Hello, everybody. Welcome to Streaming Consciousness, a very provocative and uh, interesting, I would say, discussion on some of the most critical taboos and religious um, sacred cows and about evolving out of the bondage of religious tyranny into a free-spirited and spiritual or mystical experience of yourself as divine, as a god with a little g, your divine essence. So I tap on your thinking, on I try to stretch your thinking and provoke you and invoke in you a different way of thinking about yourself, including God. Because our appreciations and appraisals of God uh, are how we appreciate and appraise ourselves. It's very important for you to know. There are billions and billions of people on the planet who believe in God or a God or gods, deities, entities, ubiquitous, um, invisible, powerful, uh, omniscient, all-knowing, and um, omnipotent, all-powerful beings particularly the Abrahamic faiths of uh, Judaism, Christianity, and and uh, Islam. But I want to, um, and I'm going to be talking about those, but not exclusively those, but primarily those. Together, they make up about uh, close to 2 billion people on this planet. Three. Uh, Christianity and Buddhism, or Christianity and Hindu uh, Islam, pretty much claims to, to have close to a billion people, followers. And... Um, uh, you know, there's maybe three or four hundred million Protestants or Protestants within Christianity. Uh, so, but there's about a billion, uh, 700, 800 million to a billion Catholics, Roman Catholics. The word Catholic means universal in Latin, but the Roman Catholic is the Roman universal church all over the world. That's the largest presence and um, legal ex- uh, sort of recognized expression of Christianity. The Protestants or Protestants came out of the Reformation. Uh, I think of the 14th century with Martin Luther, um, who protested a lot of the rituals and rules of Catholicism. And later on, you have the Anglican Church because of King J- King Henry the Fourth, I think it is, who didn't want him, who divorced and remarried and wanted to stay a part of the Catholic Church. And that was not acceptable. So he started his Anglican uh, Church, out of which has grown things like the Congregationalist Church in America and what have you. Anyway, religion, religion, religion. So I want to talk about all this because there's a tyranny, uh, fear-based theology out there that I think is crippling the planet, has caused a kind of psychosis, and particularly the concept of an angry God who owns hell, invented hell, and will commission eternally billions of people there. Uh, there's a fear around this God and all gods with this kind of invisibility and uh, this uh, ubiquitous presence um, and all this power. So we're all intimidated, wretches, you know, groveling and, and scraping around on planet trying to, to um, appease this angry God and please this difficult one. So in the series about the Bible, which is a huge component of our whole faith uh, discipline and the articles of faith, uh, and the Bible has become an idol to a lot of people. We want to talk about the Bible. I've been a great student of it for many years more a student than a scholar, but both. I've taken a lot of scholarly approaches to scripture, even though I was brought up in a denomination and a religious discipline that did not encourage or know the virtues or value of critical thinking. We just accept everything by faith, which means blinded faith or blind faith. And I don't really, really believe that people are necessarily blind, necessarily blind, but blindfolded by religion, dogma, doctrines, certain disciplines that keep them from ever experiencing or even expressing uh, the truth of their heart, the way they have experienced their God selves or their experience of God apart from religion. There is an experience of God apart from a religion, and there is a faith that transcends it. And that's what I'm trying to get people to reconsider as a possibility in their lives. So we're going to talk about, and I've had a lot of thoughts about the Bible and hell and eternal torture and the image of a God who is basically a terrorist entity, viciously angry, uh, with violent temper tantrums and the fear uh, that pervades and prevails uh, the consciousness of billions of human beings of the so-called faith community who subconsciously and often unconsciously take or assume that wobbly, wounding, and foreboding characteristic and have for centuries. Not just Christians, but Orthodox Jews, uh, Muslims, um, and all 
uh, and both of them are 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 uh, based on some Bible or the Torah or the Quran. There's about a billion Muslims and about a billion Christians and a few hundred million Jews, uh, just of the Abrahamic faith. And of course, you got Hindus and Buddhists, and they they represent ser- several billion. Altogether, the planet itself has a religious um, syncopation, not synchronicity, but a syncopation that they all adhere to. People have a like a God vacuum humans do uh, or a curiosity about the unknown god a god that is um uh we try to mimic or emulate sometimes duplicate based on imagery or imagination tra- traditional um uh, concepts of god and we're sorting through all that here it is the 20th century and people are leaving church by by the millions, leaving religions or traditional religions, creating their own spiritualities and their own paths. And, of course, uh, it's causing quite a convolution and a revolution at the same time. There's a, there's, a, there's a huge conflict out there in the minds of many people, particularly the generations that are coming. Mine, the baby boomers, we're the, probably the last generation that has embraced traditional religious mod- models and modalities and modules uh, we're the ones that are questioning, not with the same intensity that the generations following us, our children and grandchildren. They're not even questioning. They're just not. They're ignoring our religion. It's been very frustrating, very frightening, very intimidating because we seem to have no control over them. If we can't get the fear of God in them, then uh, that means they're not going to adhere to any laws and rules, and they're going to be chaotic and anarchic. And so that, those are fears. That's not necessarily the case, but that's the way we perceive the case. And as you know, perception is the ultimate reality, though not necessarily the ultimate truth. So we're all dealing with these fears. Now, I'm going to talk mostly about the Bible, which I think has become an idol. And I, I've, I'm a student of it for many, many years, long before I went to college, long before I majored in biblical literature, English Bible, long before I studied theology and historical studies, which was my minor in college, long before I began actually preaching, even before I could read it, I believed it, I feared it, I reverenced it. I, I think I probably worshipped it. I keep it near me all the time, even though I've analyzed it and criticized it and and uh, unpacked it as much as I can. I do take it very seriously. I just don't take it literally, and that really upsets some people. There's a lot. If you take the Bible literally and it... The Bible itself says the letter, meaning the literal, that's where we get the term in English, the letter kills. Spirit gives life. If you literally accept this and interpret it, uh, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. And I found the conflict for many, many years before I spoke of it as a preacher. I've been licensed as a minister for 45 years, ordained for 43. This is coming off August. Uh, A fundamentalist Pentecostal a charismatic religion that believed strictly in holiness or hell. You live holy based on the moral codes of the Bible or you go to hell. These codes and, 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 and uh, codifications have been set up to appease or please, appease the angry God and appease a difficult one. It has created a kind of psychosis on the planet, particularly in our religion. As I look at it today, how I was raised now the fourth generation in that particular religious discipline and the dysfunctionalism of the families, uh, the the, the substance abuse, the divorce rates, the the unhappiness, the adultery and or fornication or the propensities uh, toward repetitive sins, uh, all the things that, that, and we have a lot of substance abuse, both uh, uh, legal and non-legal. Uh, I'm watching it. I mean, I'm a bishop in the church for many years and a pastor for 35 years. I can't, you can imagine maybe the things I face with regard to the the dysfunction of the families of the faith or the mind, uh, the variations of sins, what we call sins in our tradition, Uh, everything in there that's breakable, we've broken it. The more rules you make, the more rules you break. And then the guilt and the shame and the sham and the hypocrisy, the word actually means acting or to act. Uh, the church is full of actors, role players, uh, various expressions or forms of hypocrisy. It's everywhere. It's very frustrating and many people have left the church altogether. I'm just bringing these things to the forefront, not to be critical, but to observe what we have created in, and to raise the possibility uh, that we could create something different. Something other than, something better than uh, what we have created. Look what we produced on the planet. Worldwide. 
Look at what's happening in the world and what's moving it. This fear of God and we, we take on those characteristics. A very popular and for many powerful mantra uh, and in, or incantation or invocation or invitation from some people, provocation in the lives of millions of people is what you hear every Sunday by America's most popular preacher and pastor, Joel Osteen, whom I've known for over 35 years. I knew his father much better, and uh, but I know him, know his wife. I've preached there. I preached before he was the pastor. I've preached since he was the pastor. I attended his father's funeral. I love them very dearly, and I respect them. And this is something I hear them say every week, and I said it with them for many, many years, as millions do today. This is my, you hold your Bible up. This, John Osteen himself started this, but Joel uh, continues the legacy, and it's pretty powerful and precious. But there's some things that are sort of... Uh, catatonic about it but still it it plays well um this is my bible i am what it says i am i can do what it says i can do today i will be taught the word of god and we'll deal with that term further along in this series um i boldly confess my mind is alert my heart is receptive i will never be the same i'm about to receive the incorruptible indestructible ever living seed of the word of god there it is again i will never be the same never 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 i will never be the same in jesus name amen now millions quote that mantra every sunday and from the bottom of their hearts, and they envision that that reality can occur in their lives with regard to the good things the Bible says. Not that you're hell-bound, which you'll never hear Joel preach a message about hell. He doesn't really preach against anything except for deadly negative emotion. He talks sort of positively and, and motivationally and about the possibilities of your life. That's why millions love him all across the board, including atheists. And then he gets a lot of criticism by fundamentalists because he's Christianity, L-I-T-E, light, not enough scripture, not enough meanness, not enough hellfire and brimstone, that kind of thing. Joel's doing a great job. He's introducing uh, a brand of Christianity that I think is is uh, a much more favorable brand, if, if you will. And um, I think he's expanding in his consciousness and embraces certain aspects of new thought, though we may not use that terminology. But he's a thinker. And they're putting a lot of pressure on him. And I guarantee you, Joel is, uh, is growing in spirit. Otherwise, he will stagnate. And I know he doesn't want to do that. So where does this whole concept come from of God that is, uh, and it's not recent. Long before Christianity or Judaism existed, there were fear of the gods. It goes way back to earliest civilizations, including the Egyptians and prior to them, the Sumerians and the Akkadians and existences of humanity for hundreds and thousands of years, perhaps millions, uh, which is, again, against the chronology of the Bible, which is about has humanity about 6,000 years old, and I believed that for years, but science proves otherwise. Even Pat Robertson now says that he'll have to go for science because it's proven technically, scientifically, that humankind has existed far longer than 6,000 years. They're finding skeletal remains that are 10 million years old and what have you, so, so they say. Anyway, um, there's a lot out there. Now, where, but where does the fear come from? In the Christian Judeo or Judeo-Christian mentality, God has always been frightening and intimidating. And uh, we have assumed to presume this God to be uh, real and alive and a, a personal God who sits in heaven on a throne, uh, who I like to say is making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. And, uh, you know, we're afraid of this God. And so we've developed not only Christians and Jews, but Muslims and many religions around the world have developed certain disciplines or doctrines or dogmas to appease this God or the gods so that you don't get cursed. And we have come up with sacrifice of, of plants and animals and then ultimately humans to appease this God who requires blood sacrifices to appease its anger. And its anger is based around various aspects or varying, as, varying aspects of sin. And they were all afraid to tick this God off, turn this God off, and, uh, you know, make it angry at us. And then here comes earthquakes and volcanoes and tornadoes and tsunamis and global warming and um, or uh, uh, terrible snowstorms. And Chicago's experiencing the longest uh, temperatures uh, below zero in its history, I think. Uh, and then they say because of El Nino, we're going to have some of the hottest, warmest summers. Uh, this this coming summer, this very summer, and then a milder winter, perhaps next year. El Niños come every few years. El Nino means the child in in Latin, meaning the sun, 
reference basically to, to Jesus indirectly. Um, but let me start off with some scriptures that, um, that make people very afraid of God. And that's something that I'm reconsidering. I, I have reconsidered. I do not fear God. Uh, I kind of fear people who fear God. <laughs> because people who fear God will do horrible things to appease that God's anger. And to work with their fear. In fact, in fact, the term a God-fearing man or person in this culture, American culture, tends to mean you can trust them because they fear God's terror and will not break laws or rules or morals or integrity. They'll be honest in business because they don't want to tick God off or they'll be responsible to their spouses and they won't drink and tip and dip and sip and lie and cuss and fuss and kill and cut. So, you know, because if they're, if they're God-fearing people, well, they have a moral conscience and praise God, they're going to they're gonna live right, they're going to do right, and they're going to be right. At least they're going to act right. Even if they, in their heart they want to do some horrible things, they're going to basically do what's right, not because they love you or even love righteousness or rightness. They'll do right because they fear a God they believe will k- cut them, kill them, curse them forever. Now think about this before you jump to conclusions. Let me read a scripture out of Deuteronomy ten seventeen, which Deuter, Deuteronomy, that means the second or the final expression of Moses to the children of Israel. He was about to be taken from them or die. He didn't, we didn't, according to the scripture, his body was never found. He was just taken. But he's been with them 40 years and he's got them to the Red Sea, uh, to, uh, to the Red Sea across which, uh, led them across. And now they can see Jordan, um, really Jericho, across the Jordan River. And they're going to be good. He doesn't get to go there. But he writes and pens, so they say, this other stuff. We don't really know that he wrote it, but he may have spoken it. And his scribes wrote behind a lot of questions about that. But anyway, Moses puts this out there. Deuteronomy, okay, I'm going to rehearse everything a second time. All the stuff I've been teaching you, I'm about to get out of here, so I'm going to say it the second time. Deuter. King James Version has it this way. Deuteronomy 10, 70. For the Lord your God is God of gods, which means right there that Jews believe there were other gods with a little g. One monotheistic, one God with a capital G, Jehovah or Yahweh, self-sustaining, self-existent God. Uh, so there's a conflict uh, and there's competition from the beginning about the gods. Okay, For the Lord your God is God of gods. He doesn't say he's the only God, he just says he's the primary God of all the other gods. Because Egypt had gods, and they saw those gods in action. They saw even Moses when he did his magic, the Egyptians, uh, magicians came and did their magic, you know, turning the the, uh, the stick into a serpent and back and forth. They had magicians and astrologers and mystics and shaman in all cultures. And the Israelites thing was to keep away from the other cultures and their magic or their, their magi, their gods, their shaman, their mystics. Stay with ours, this one God and uh, who does miracles too. And there's always been the conflict of the miracles. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, and Lord, capital L, of Lord, smaller L in the King James Version, a great God, a mighty, and a, quote-unquote, terrible. A terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Now, to read that from, from the King James Version without the other t- uh, translations, when you, when you say regardeth not persons like God doesn't care about anybody. Uh, he does not regard or consider or respect people. God is God. He's God by himself. He's terrible. He's mighty. He's the God of all gods. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'm the only. The Lord thy God is one. Means I'm the only. The Lord your God is only. That's where we get the word one. Or only is from the word only or only one. The Lord your God is one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He didn't say you should have no other gods beside me, but just none before me. You're going to have your other gods. We all have our other gods. Whether that's our children, our spouse, our jobs, our careers, some rituals, some doctrine, our doc, our dogmas, our Bibles. Those are all gods with a little g. And they all supposedly, but they're not supposed to come before the big God. Okay? Uh, and the word terrible there, yare in Hebrew, means fear or to revere or to be frightened or dread, terrorized. God has is, is significant with fear and dread and terror. We creep around. We're wretches undone. 
you know, we're, we're, we're caterpillars, we're roaches and ro rodents and rats and, and we're horrible and we're sinful and oh wretched man that I am, Paul said, who shall deliver me from this death place, sinful, debased nature? Oh God, please forgive me. This whole cowering mentality prevails in the culture, the common culture, subconsciously and often unconsciously. That's a critical influence on the thinking and the psyche or psychology of the human race. Not just Christians, but the human race, but particularly Christians. The New Living Translation has it this way. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, same thing, Lord of lords, big little, big letter, little letter. He is the great God, the mighty and awesome, slash really awful, full of awe or terror, this ominous being, omen. God is an omen or omeness. God is frightening or frightened. It's like God's paranoid. Who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. Indirectly, that means he cannot be pleased or appeased or satiated. You can't bribe God, even with your righteousness. So the scripture says all of your righteousness are as filthy rags. That's Old Testament. But we take it seriously. All the Judaic or the legalistic righteousness, I don't care how righteous you are, you're not good enough. In fact, the, the King James New Testament says the righteous shall scarcely make it in. So where shall the ungodly appear? If the righteous shall scarcely, barely, almost not make it in. That, those kinds of little signals are all out there. Nobody really feels that they can live up to, to please this very difficult entity. I, the Lord thy God, I'm perfect. Be thou perfect as I am. Well, you spirit and stuff, we down here spitting and coughing and peeing and eating and squatting and fussing and scratching and itching. So we're going to be perfect like this ubiquitous, invisible, omnipresent, omnipotent, omnipotent, and omniscient, omniscient, all-knowing entity who doesn't pee, <laughs> who doesn't eat, who doesn't bathe or sleep or shower or work or use computers or who's always been around, does sit on the throne. What else does he do on the throne? Does he have a scepter? Does he have all these angels fanning him with palm leaves? And, and uh, does he have a devil that he owns and permits to exist infinitely, even after the end of the world and this devil is still down there tormenting billions of people or thrown into the lake of fire? Well, we always believe that the devil lived in hell anyway. He's pretty accustomed to the lake and the fire. So throwing that devil into the lake of fire as revelation says means that he possibly won't suffer the way we suffer because he's familiar with hell and the lake of fire and or fire come on think about all this we've been told all this stuff his final judgment and punishment is to be thrown with the rest of us now may, even if you live 16 and the devil has been here infinitely since the beginning and he gets the same punishment since that devil is responsible for all these billions of people going to hell anyway, then his final judgment is to simply be thrown into the lake of fire with the 16-year-old kid, a 60-year-old man, somebody that's never heard about Jesus, never will hurt, or somebody that didn't believe what he heard about Jesus. I mean, just think about this whole scenario. It's ridiculous. It's superstitious. It's ferritilic. And I'm not throwing everything away. I'm just saying a lot of the superstitions, the peripheral stuff, is not working for me. And it's really not working on the planet, except to supposedly scare the hell out of people or scare them out of hell, keep them from going to hell. But they're going through it and they're creating it because they have this incredible belief in it, not only in hell, but a God who would even invent something that's called eternal, infinite, unending torture. Who's going to trust that God? You will fear that God. You may even go through the rituals of worshiping that God to a to avoid its wrath. But you're not going to love that God. And you're never going to trust that God. Because it's obvious that God's never going to trust you. That God's suspicious of you. So that God created you. Also created devils and demons and angels. And a lot of other invisible things that are for and or against you. So you're looking over your shoulder at a demon that you can't see. And a God that you can't see. And you're scared the hell out of both of them. Come on. Can we talk? Just think about it. And our Bibles, based on the way we interpret them, 
support that fear-based theology. Substantiate it. Because it's in the Word of God. The Word of God says, what Bible do you read, Carl? I'm, I'm reading you. I'm reading me. That Bible says that I'm a living letter. I read what my soul says to me, what my spirit reveals or unveils or uncovers or recovers for me, as me. And when I look into me, I don't see that. I don't see that foolishness or that fear or that frantic psychology. However pompous and pious it comes across. You can have all the crystals and candles and, and, and crucifixes and pulpits and stained glass windows and all that stuff that we like. You know, your 16th century king's English prophecies and all that. I understand all that. I've been to the Vatican. I understand the certain sense of awe and that it's an incredible place. I've been in Jewish synagogues and Muslim mosques. I've gotten down on the floor with my shoes off like Muslims and faced the east and prayed and was sincere in my prayers. I've been to the Wailing or Western Wall many times. I'm planning another trip there in 2015. You may want to come along with me. We postponed the one for 13 to 14 to make it to 15 to give you more time. But it'll be the first inclusion peace tour, radically loving tour ever hosted. And the man that is, that is my tour guide and, and sponsoring this trip with me and working with me is a, is a consultant to the Prime Minister of Israel. So we have lots of inroads there, but it's not going to be just a Jewish thing or a Christian thing. It's going to be Muslims. We're going to go up to, Baha to, um, to the Baha'i Temple in, um, in Haifa up north. It's going to be a wonderful trip. And so you can go to my site and type in uh, uh, Israel Tour and uh, you can be a part of that and start saving now a few hundred, a few dollars every month or every week. So you can go. It'll cost you two or three thousand dollars. Anyway. That's about, and we're going to sign something, a, a, a sort of a declaration on Mount Zion, uh, where the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim nations come together about peace, a peace agreement that we're going to do for, and, and release that energy to the universe out there, because I believe that peace is possible. So anyway, um, then Hebrews, let's, let's jump to the New Testament. I've read the Old Testament scriptures. There are other ones about the fear of God or the terror of God, this whole psychotic uh, uh, Embolism, I think it's 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 frightening that it's frightening, and it's sad that it exists. Hebrews ten thirty thirty one. For we know him who said, "Watch this." Very intimidating. One of the most intimidating scriptures in the Bible. And this particular translation I'm reading has it all in caps. This these words in capital: "Vengeance is mine," saith the Lord. I will repay. And again. There's, this is Hebrews quoting Old Testament passages. The Lord will judge his people. Now, for we know him, God, who said, this is Hebrew. Nobody knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. It sounds like Paul, many people believe it's Paul, but it, there is no verified, certified author. And there are other books in the scriptures that we really don't know who wrote them. And yet we accept them, not as forgeries, but as the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. And we don't even know who wrote it. I don't need to know who wrote it. God wrote it. Praise God. I'm walking by faith. You're walking by foolishness. And your foolish concepts and beliefs have screwed up this planet. And as much as I have studied this word and keep it near me, and, you know, I'm, yes, there's a little bit of conflict because I still, I mean, I, I raised around it. It's like my parents quoted scripture. My dad can barely read, but they would quote scripture all the time. We quote it. All my sisters and my brother, we can quote scripture because we lived around it, not only in our house, but in the community, our family, our cousins, everybody basically in our churches knew the scriptures. We lived by it. Anyway, let me read Hebrews. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. So God is vindictive. I'll get you. I'll get all of you. I will repay. Revenge, vengeance, is mine. Now, does that sound like a loving God whose mercy endures forever? Love is patient. Read, read the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Is all those, are all those virtues in 1 Corinthians 13 virtues of God? Doesn't sound like it here. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Very frightening terms, terminologies, beliefs, and belief systems. Verse 31, it is a terrible or terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now that scripture, it is a terrible thing or terrifying thing. This is Hebrews. Okay, I read the scriptures in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy. This is Hebrews. It's a terrible thing to fall, fumble, flounder, descend into the hands of the living God. 
Because we're always saying, put it in the Lord's hands. Give it to God. You're in the hands of the Lord. Well, is that dangerous? Or is that a safe harbor? We have all these mixed signals in our belief systems and in Christianity. That's why religious folk can be so crazy. They're, they're, they're mentally ill. <laughs> I, I'm not trying to be unkind. I, I just, I've been around this so long. I've read it, taught it, preached it, believed and or accepted or believed without necessarily accepting all of it for the first 50 years of my life. And yes, I'm going to be 61 on my next birthday. If you're watching this live or in, in 2014, March, next month, I'm the 19th, I'm going to turn 61. Okay. I've evolved a lot. I didn't expect to be, be here at 61. Not at all. I expected to have my big church in Tulsa, be solidly founded there as one of the senior clerics of the city, loved by the people who I trained and, and baptized and, and, and married and buried and, you know, nurtured and counseled and watched over their souls, whom I still love very much. Thousands of them don't, of course, follow me anymore. Um, and they're not fond of me as I am. They're fond of me as I was. And I understand that. And I, there's nothing I can do about that. Some of them are turning. And actually, thousands of them are beginning to reconsider because so much has happened. So much water under the bridge since all of that conflict 10 years ago or so. Anyway, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, I, the Lord, will judge his people. Verse 31, it is a terrible thing to fall in, into the hands of a living God. A lot of terror, fear intimidation, uh, propagation, propaganda in religions, all of them. But I'm ex particularly addressing the one that I was raised in, Christianity. Someone sent this quote to me by this preacher named John Piper, who for 33 years served um, as a senior pastor of the Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and is now the chancellor of a fundamentalist college and seminary. Seminary, to inseminate. Semen, that's what it comes from. You're being inseminated with whatever, and it takes root inside of you. He's founder of, and teacher of, of, of a ministry called DesiringGod.org. You can check him out. John Piper, uh, spelled P-I-P-E-R, and DesiringGod.org. He's very fundamental. He's very strict, very, very, um, really kind of arrogant. He's author of more than 50 books, so obviously he has a following. His quote stopped me dead in my tracks. Somebody sent it to me. So I had to post something about it. He says... One key to the Bible. We're going to talk about this Bible, the Word of God, or inerrant, infallible, authoritative. One key to the Bible, he says, because of the seriousness of every person's sin, the harsh treatment by God is never too harsh, ever. The harsh treatment by God is never too harsh, ever, he says, because of the seriousness of the ominousness of every man's sin. And an angry God with these terrible anger problems that you have to tiptoe around this God and beg him to not really see you who you are. Please don't know my thoughts. Please don't read my mind. I'm angry. I'm frightened. I'm lustful. I'm covetous. I'm proud and ego driven and testosterone driven driven i'm angry i don't really like you god i'm scared of you 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 intimidate me oh my god and you know this what am i gonna do oh jesus please here's here's an offering here's a tithe i'll go to church i'll read the bible every day i'll quote i'll even witness to people please don't please don't treat me like i deserve please don't see me as i am please god don't be omniscient don't know everything give me some privacy be powerful, but not all powerful, because I'm scared of your power. You're too, you're too damn strong. <laughs> I'm scared of you. I don't know what to do with you. And you're everywhere. Even in my mind, I'm intimidated by you. Now, I'm saying what millions don't dare acknowledge they think. I mean, I'm not saying everybody does, but I would say 99% of the folks, 99.99% .99 of them do. One key to the Bible, says this preacher, because of the seriousness of every person's sin, no harsh treatment by God is ever too harsh, ever. Kind of reminds me of a scene in the Oscar-winning movie, which I saw, 12 Years a Slave, where the slave plantation owner, right at the beginning of the movie, uh, stands before the slaves. They're all seated there on rocks and roots and stuff, um, where the slave plantation owner reads the scripture in the New Testament. 
which admonishes slaves to obey their masters, and that, he goes on to read scriptures, supporting that disobeying their masters scripturally supports swift and harsh punishment. What he was saying, biblically, I'm going to beat you behind. Biblically, I'm going to strip you of your clothes, of your dignity, and I'm going to beat you if you don't obey me. The Bible says it. Slaves, obey your masters. That's in your New Testament Bible. Take it literally. Oh, particularly the African American churches that are so against what, what, what Carlton Pearson is preaching, against gays and same sex marriage and any kind of freedoms, and they don't mind the government shutting them down, like what's happening in Uganda. It's the fundamentalist Christians that are causing gay people in Uganda to be killed and beaten and tortured legally and imprisoned. Some of them are right now being tortured or beaten uh, in the streets. Because this whole concept of a God who ultimately tortures and beats or whips, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, that God endorses that whole experience. Uh, people who believe in that don't mind imputing that kind of judgment uh, on people on this planet. Right now, today, like Hitler did. You ought to read my book, God is Not a Christian. I actually have documented quotes of Hitler saying, I did this to serve Jesus, my Lord and Savior. He worked with the Catholic Church and uh, I guess at some point confessed Christ. We don't know this, but we are told that one of his grandmothers might have been Jewish. But obviously this man was psychotic. But he, where did he get the idea to use fire to torture or destroy people? Could it be the Bible? Because God uses fire to impute his ultimate judgment and wrath on the disobedient people, the unbelievers, the infidels, the heathen, the pagans. Come on, think about this. Hitler knew the scriptures and believed some of them. He was into superstition and witchcraft and paranormals. People even think that he had communication with extraterrestrials or at least believed in them or were curious about it. He was, uh, he was a monster based on his belief systems. There are still Hitlers, Hitlers, and Hurtlers out there. Some of them are sitting up in church every Sunday, like members of the Ku Klux Klan. You couldn't be a member of the Ku Klux Klan unless you believe in the scriptures and confess Jesus as your Lord. You had to be a Christian to be a member of the KKK. That rule still holds. This lady recently, uh, they just found a lady here within the last couple of days, or yesterday, who drove her van into the sea in, 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 uh, in, in Florida. Drove all the way down, I think, from North Carolina. And she said that Jesus told her to do this. She's going to drown herself and her kids, her little infant child. And the eldest in the car, I think, was like nine or something. And she took all kid, three kids and that Jesus told her because there were demons in her house and possibly demons in her kids. She was either saving her kids from the demons or saving the world from the demons her kids were. But it was a religious thing. We believe in demons and devils and a God who judges and hates. And I mean, the hell concept is not just punitive or punishment. It is hatred. God would have to hate the sinners as much as the sin and maybe more than the sin because the sin lives on. But the sinner is hated by God and tortured infinitely. Well, that's in the Bible. Well, then you need to reassess your Bible to just get rid of it. Because your appraisal of it and your interpretation of it literally like that makes you an angry, vicious, vindictive, intimidated and intimidating, fear-based monster. You could, you're, you're a ticking time bomb. You could explode and just go bananas on everybody like you think God someday will or has in times past with t tsunamis and tornadoes and volcanoes and earthquakes and, and famine and stuff that God gets mad and just throws his hell out of heaven onto the earth and looks the other way and ignores it. That's my judgment. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. That whole mentality. Why do I address it? Because after 45 years of studying the scriptures and 61 on the planet, that stuff doesn't work for me. And I've ministered to thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who really struggle with this just within the religious world. The counseling and the therapy um, is, is a lot of it's based on people's crazy ideas about God. It's on their crazy stinking thinking or theology. And nobody wants to address it. So, yes, it's cost me a lot. And I get, I, you know, I, I enrage a lot of people. And I, I really don't like that part of it. 
But I'd rather do this than let, let us just keep going. I have some influence as a person and as a man of faith and as a bishop in the Lord's, the Lord's church, supposedly. Even, even when my kids came in and I said, you're wearing that, Dad? I, I'm not dressed up. You know, I don't have tie and I have collars and vestments and I got casual things. And uh, But I'm not trying to come across as a preacher creature on this stuff, even though I claim, you know, some authority. Uh, ecclesiastical or cl- uh, clerical authority as an ordained, licensed ministry, legitimately in the in the in the by the laws of this c- country, and by the, some of the laws of the church. I've pastored, I've installed pastors, I've licensed uh, deacons and ordained pastors, and installed pastors and consecrated bishops, along with colleges of bishops. I know all that role playing, and I know its value and some of the virtue of it, you know, in certain expressions. But I'm beyond that. I'm not. I'm not defined by that. I'm not confined to that mentality. And neither should you or anybody be. In fact, I know so many bishops who are where I am in consciousness. It's just not cost effective for them to openly acknowledge it. I know where they are. I know how they live. I mean, hundreds of them are in major conflict, spiritually, and more so mentally. They're going through what you've heard me call the cognitive dissonance. When they're believing and teaching something that is inconsistent with their real thought life or their belief system. They're thundering these messages out. And they believe it's crap. Some of them will tell you. It's BS. That's the term. They'll, they'll actually say it out. I don't believe all that stuff. But it pays my rent or my mortgage or my parsonage. Oh, I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict, or I do this, or I do that. I've had them come and tell me because they know I'm not going to judge them. Though they get up in the pulpit, and do you know there's about twelve to 1,500 pastors leaving the ministry every month in this country, according to statistics? Thousands of other laity leaving the church altogether every month? And the church want to keep their head in the sand and act like it's not happening? It is happening. And that's not all bad. In fact, I don't think it's bad at all. It's probably good because people now may actually really experience God apart and away from that that particular community that thinks they control God, own God, and know God. Now, does that sound harsh? I don't mean for it to, and yet I do mean for it to, because I want to really connect with, um, and I, I don't know who will see this stuff. I may be in my grave before you know this message really takes on, but I'm going to share it because I feel like that's part of my life's purpose, my calling and coding. In addition to all of the things that I deny nothing, and I don't even regret what I did in the past. That's what I felt. I had to go through that. You can't teach what you don't know. You can't lead where you don't go. So I experienced a lot of this that I'm talking about. So this this guy, this Piper man, um, enjoys a significantly large following of people who obviously enjoy his take on scriptural inerrancy and infallibility as the absolute and final authority on God, truth, faith, and God's chosen people who, of course, are born-again followers of Jesus, who don't sin, especially after conversion. And if they do, they go to the same hell all non-believing, non-Christian peoples of the earth do. I mean, that's the mentality of this man and his followers. It was mine for several years. The Islamic world calls all non-Muslims infidels, a person who does not believe in religion or who adheres to a religion other than one's own. Christians do likewise in reference to all non-Christians. They're called infidels. The Muslims are calling us infidels. We're calling them infidels, and we will fight. There are many Christians, Bible-toting, Christ-confessing, baptized in the Trinity or, or Jesus' name, anointed with oil, take Holy Communion, pray, read the Scripture, who would, who would think nothing of dropping a bomb on a Muslim or shooting one down, or rejoicing when our armies do that. It's a conflicted mentality. Same Muslims, very devout, praying five times a day, more than any of the other religions, facing east, taking your shoes off in the, in the mosque, staying away from pork, no wine, the women dress holy, you don't see their bodies, uh, but they'll kill you at, a, at the drop of a hat, just like Christians and many Jews. All religious people, all sons of Abraham, Come on, how long are we going to do this? Keep fighting each other, holding on to these sacred cows, putting them up, cruise affixion or crusade. Cruise is the Latin word for cross. Asphyxiation of the cross is crucifixion. Aiding the cross is the crusade. 
which Christians took, put on their shields and their breastplates and went to Israel and bludgeoned thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Muslims. So you go to a Muslim country with a crusade, they remember what that means. They ain't thinking about the cross or Jesus or salvation. They're thinking about bludgeoning and war and, and killing the women and children and animals. They say blood ran as high as up to the horse's knees in Jerusalem when the Christians went over there with the crusades and killed the Muslims. Now, I fully understand the mindset of these Christians because I used to live there. And for the most part, for 50 years of my life, I was into this whole mentality, not eagerly, but certainly willingly. The Bible particularly portrays God as indeed harsh, angry, violent, egotistical, unmerciful, and pretty much a frightened and frightening, intimidated and intimidating terrorist type entity to be feared, worshipped, and if possible, loved but at least feared and worshipped and served because the consequences are hell. Now just think about that. A lot of these people saying they love God, they don't love God. And if they do love God, they love God only as Jesus who protects them from God with his blood and with the cross so that even when they sin, his blood covers them so that they don't offend the other God. That's why we worship Jesus more than we worship God because we don't even like God. We don't want to worship God. We'll do it because we're afraid of him. But we really love Jesus because Jesus basically protects us from that God. Jesus comes across really a lot sweeter. Even a couple times he gets angry and turns over the table. But it's with the religious people. He doesn't like the fundamentalists. Uh, they are his nemesis the whole time that he ministers three and a half years. We don't know what he does with 18 of those years, 30, 33 and a half that he lived. We know what happened from 1 to 12, sort of. Nothing between 12 and 30. And then three and a half years... He wrestles with demons and Pharisees. <laughs> uh, that's in the Bible. The Bible say. So what concerns me, though, about this Mr. Piper, uh, and, and I'm not concerned about what he believes, but I am concerned that hundreds of millions believe that kind of stuff, including many devout Muslims and Jews as well. They believe this image of God who is a, a, a tyrant, and therefore the tyranny that that God imputes through the religions that we mentioned tonight and others, uh, is legitimate and certified and verified and, and clarified among the people. There are whole doctrines and denominations and structures been set in place for thousands of years to, to proliferate this whole image of God, keeping the peer, people under fear. Reformist thinkers among all the Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianityism, are considered heretics. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a reformist thinker. We're considered deviants and liberals by this fundamentalist group. But our numbers seem to be growing exponentially every day as people are awakening by the thousands and tens of thousands to a new way of thinking, a new way of being, a new way of identifying with the global human community and away from the us-against-them mentality of much of, of militant religionism or militant religion, the guys that want to fight all the time. Do you see the Bible do you see, I asked this question today, and boy, the conversations have been just prolific. Do you see the Bible as a harsh warning to all of humanity that if they don't respect, read, reverence, and respond appropriately to it, they will go to hell, as vividly described within, the, within its pages and is interpreted literally as saying? Do you believe in the Bible as harsh uh, a warning to all of humanity that you better believe it or you're going to go to hell. So we're engaging tonight and last week and for the next few weeks um, on this whole word of God thing. If there really is something like that word of God fully existing to the earth and that uh, and is that the only legitimate and authentic way God speaks today? If God speaks at all. What do you say? Well, most of us believe God speaks if only to us. <laughs> We also have this other conversation that God speaks about us, both to the devil and to Jesus and to the judges of the eons. And that God speaks to the earth about us and tells it when to shut up and show up. That God carries on conversations with the sun uh, and famine and wind and earthquakes and volcanoes. That God's carrying on these conversations with itself or himself and all of his counsel let us make man they have become like us knowing so there's all these conversations going on 
that are hidden and private and creepy and spooky, and we don't trust that God. Now, Michael Dowd, a dear friend of mine, a brilliant man, a brilliant thinker, um, he wrote an article titled Idolatry of the Written Word. I'm going to quote it a little bit tonight, and uh, we'll talk more about his stuff later. Christianity, he says, is shipwrecked on the rock of biblical authority. Whew, just, I've been basically talking about that. Christianity is shipwrecked on the rock of biblical authority. Now, this man has preached in UCC churches. He knows something about the charismatic movement, scriptures. He's a scholar, a brilliant thinker. He's written several books. Um, he notes that 1,200 people a day leave the church. Those are statistics. 1,200 people a day are abandoning religion as they've known it. Porn addiction, alcohol abuse, domestic violence are epidemic in conservative parts of America. Did you hear that? This is, can be statistically documented. That porn addiction, addiction to pornography, alcohol or other substance abuse, including uh, illegal drugs, and domestic violence are epidemic in conservative parts of America, more in the religious realms and, and regions than the less religious or non-religious. Atheists have a much lower divorce rate than Christians. Why? What's happening with us? The Bible... Once an asset, he, he writes, has become a liability. Why? Because the Bible has been idolized. The Bible, a rich book with some tremendous information and documentations and invocations. Uh, I've had an attachment to it for years, uh, but I'm detaching myself from a lot of it and re-investigating re, um, it. And doing it with a certain elements of reverence and respect, but I'm coming to the conclusion that uh, basically it's not only the greatest story ever told, it's the greatest story ever sold, and millions of us bought into it. So how's that working for you, Mr. Porn Addict who loves Jesus, reads the Bible, pastors or preaches under the anointing? How's that working for you? who are struggling with alcohol or substance abuse, as doing as the scripture says, drinking ye all of it, and you're drunk, in the pulpit drunk. How does this work for you with terrible marital dissatisfaction and a strong tendency and temptation to sleep around or lust? How many of you are bisexual or really homosexual, and you, but you're preaching and thundering against it because you don't want anybody to know that you are gay or that you have um, fantasies about it or rationalizations about it. Um, how many of you are lustful looking at all the other women in the church or men, if you will? I'm not trying to be harsh, and yet I am. I want to be really confronted without being combative because we played the roles too long. We're almost out of time, but I want you to think about all this. And how is the Bible working out? Do you really believe that stuff you're preaching? Maybe you do believe it, but you don't live it. <laughs> At last, when a story or a tradition becomes scripture, my friend Michael Dahl writes, that is sacred writ or writings, it ceases to evolve. Once a particular oral tradition becomes written down, it ceases to evolve, at least in any functional, intentional way. It's slopped, cast in die, cast in stone. You cannot change it. It is written, therefore it exists. It's right. Skillful and charismatic interpreters of unchanging scripture can, of course, maintain the relevance of the sacred stories for a good deal longer by continuing to evolve uh, the interpretation. So we deal with scriptures as we have for many, many years. Um, and the, 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 the entire hell and or eternal putrid punishment concept comes out of this mentality of scripture being solid and inerrant and infallible and literally interpreted. And, uh, and, it, and in reality, it is a form of insanity. When I say insanity, it's not just crazy, but your thoughts are, are not sanitized. They're not clear. They're not clean. They're murky and muddy um, and sludgy. And this, this, you have this what I call sloppy agape. You're supposed to have the love of God, but it's so sloppy and so awkward. Your love ain't working right. You don't even love you. So you don't love God. And Jesus says, love your neighbors, you love yourself. The problem is, is when you live under those kind of laws and dogmas and doctrines, you really can't love yourself. Religion is not 
designed to make you love yourself. It's designed to make you hate yourself and grovel around and go primarily through the church, which is the represent of the body of Christ. So it ain't really going through Jesus. You're going through the Jesus followers, through the church to protect you from God. Or to give you the manufacturer's manual so you can go through the book of rules and laws. When something breaks, you fix it through the scripture. Yeah, you know, I keep my wife's picture. Do you see that? Let me see so it doesn't shine. It's in my Bible. It's been there for years. Uh, pictures of my, of my sweet wife, Gina. Can you see that so it doesn't look too shiny? That's in the Bible. And I have pictures of my family. And, you know, it's like a little lucky charm. <laughs> I still have it in my room. I love it being there. I refer to it all the time. People say, well, how can you preach against the scripture and use it to preach against the self? Well, there's a lot of people who use the Constitution who haven't fully read it, but they use it to prove or disprove something. They use it against itself, against the culture, against the laws of the lawmakers in Congress, that they're lawmakers. Um, a lot of people preach the Constitution who don't really know it. They've never read it, not through, through millions of people. I would say most people preachers included, preach the Bible they have not fully read and or studied. Even if you read it, that's one thing. But studying it is something altogether different. So we're out here preaching this stuff, doing this stuff, uh, so-called believing this stuff, and we really don't believe it. We don't know what to believe. You know, there's so much fear out there. We really don't know what to say or how to, how to say it. And preachers are leaving the pulpit about... 12, 1500 a month. They're just saying, forget it. I can't do this any longer. It's not working for me. There was a time when I grieved that. But I think it's an, it's an evolution that's, that uh, is imminent. I think within the next 50 to 100 years, if not 20 to 25 years, religion, including Christianity, as we know it, will not exist with the prominence that it does today. It will dissipate and ultimately disappear. Because these are, whether you like it, support it, or believe it or not, these are changing times. The, the, the recipe may be the same, but the, um, uh, or the, 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 um, the menu may, may change, or the ingredients may change, or the recipe may change. Or the recipe will be the same, but um, they will, they will, you, you may not have the same ingredients. They don't exist any longer. Just because a recipe is there, that doesn't mean that you have all the ingredients or that that recipe is, is still valid or attractive. People's taste buds have changed over the years. The way they cook, the way they taste, there's so many more ingredients and herbs and, and your taste buds and... You can go to the same restaurant, you can watch the same TV. Ch TV is changing, what they present is changing, the way they present it. I remember black and white television days when red looked like black on television. And I had nobody had complaints about that. We expected black and white. I remember living, now in living color, NBC, in living color, the peacock for, for NBC was in living color and it was exciting the first time I saw uh, The Wizard of Oz in color or, um, um, yeah, The Wizard of Oz in color with Julie Garland. I remember the yellow brick row when I finally got to see it and not just imagine it. And when you saw um, Lucille Ball, her hair was really red. That kind of thing. Refreshing. What's changing in the culture? What's changing in religion? What's changing in your mind? And do you embrace it? And why would you not? What are you afraid of? What, are you, what intimidates you? Aren't you willing to, to open your mind? I want to close with Paul Dudley, uh, one of my favorite thinkers and friends, and he always responds to my, my blog, and he's brilliant. And he's from a Kojic back or Church of God in Christ, so that even makes me love him the more. Uh, he says, ah, oh, here we go again, in response to my comments about hell today. Trying to get the hell out of the Bible and the consciousness, parenthesis, of many who won't let go of its absurdity, its truly spiritual cumbersome, or excuse me, is truly spiritually cumbersome. It is, let me read that sentence again. Trying to get the hell out of the Bible and the consciousness of many who won't let go of its absurdity is truly spiritually cumbersome. To try to get people to get the hell out. When I say get the hell out of my Bible, I'm saying get the word hell as it's appeared out of the Bible because it's not really in there. It's the word Gehenna, not hell. Gal, gully, valley, 
Gorge, Valley of Hinnom. He goes on to say, It is apparent to me that those who intently hold on to this myth are doing so because of an age-old power struggle to keep at bay the minds of people who, if they were God and or had the power to cast people in hell, they would be sending family members, co-workers, and everyone else who has the audacity to say it doesn't exist. I mean, folks would throw us into hell just because we say it doesn't exist. He goes on to say, it's like trying to break a spell off of folk who are wrapped up and tied up into literalism and the ancient credo of the, in, of the errant biblical teachings of reward and punishment. We're locked in that whole concept of reward and punishment. It may seem harsh, he says, and even cruel, but I tend to think that those who hold on tightly to something their man-made idol, Jesus, never taught, let alone mentioned, are nothing more than Bible bumpkins who are afraid of those of us who have finally escaped from this horrible and damnable inerrant doctrine. And remember, this guy comes from a classical Pentecostal roots like me. What is taking place is nothing more than what Jesus said to John in chapter 16, verse 12. I have much more to tell you, and he promised that when the Holy Spirit comes, it will lead us into truth. <laughs> The Holy Spirit has come, according to what we Christians have been taught and believed, and I believe that God is revealing, he says, this additional information to us every day. Now, this is a man that has been in the church and the Bible all his life, so he makes references to those kinds of ideologies. The sad part, he says, is not everyone is listening. All cultures and creatures, he says, as they mature, move from myths developed in the past to clearer and clearer visions of the truth when they open up themselves up to receive the revelations of spirit and the truth it profoundly gives to him, her, that have ears to hear and then to add here. Fear is the factor that keeps orthodox, fundamentalist, and staunch church folk who believe in hell from examining the Bible and what it says and does not say about a place that does not exist. I gotta stop. <laughs> He's brilliant, but so are you. Of course, you wouldn't even be listening to me unless you were inquisitive and curious. <coughs> and uh, dissatisfied with the status quo, that's okay. I love you. I love the world. I love my image of God and what some of you sort of superficially hope God is. We don't know. I think we can experience God without ever knowing God, like we can experience wind without ever really knowing it, or experience rain uh, without knowing it intricately. And it's not necessary to do so. But we're tapping. We're expanding. We are stretching. We're extending ourselves. And that's what this is all about. Share with your friends and neighbors. And if you think it's worth your time, support what I'm saying and what I'm doing. Be a part of this great ground, ground level, um, ground roots movement toward expanded consciousness. Radically inclusive love. Peace on this planet. We're peace agents and change agents. We believe in peace. We believe that it's possible. We believe that you can be healthy, happy, and whole, or holy, if you will, without the dogma and the doctrines and some of the disciplines of your particular religion. That's your call. But we do love you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your consciousness. Thank you for your support. Yes, it's been risky, but it's worth it. It's so worth it because I'm seeing thousands and thousands of people awakening to this truth and reconsidering what they believe and why they believe it. Will you join us? Thank you. Please go to the donate button. I need you to do that tonight. I ask you at least or invite you to support what we're doing so we can expand this. I'm sitting in front of this computer and instead of television and all the lighting to do it a little bit better, to reach a larger group, um, to develop some kind of an internet radio program to build this global church without walls. That's what we want to do because we get commitments from all over the planet, people listening in every culture, every country, every continent. They're listening, and I'm so thankful. And I reach much more by cyber than I would in, you know, a physical church each week. So, would you stand with me? And maybe go with me to Israel in 2015, study the, the uh, site, find the part about Israel, and I'll be emphasizing that more. Uh, let's go there and, as peace agents and do a wonderful um, interfaith dialogue in Israel, okay? We have a lot of other things planned like cruises and trips and, and uh, conferences. So much in my spirit for us to do. Will you join me? 
I believe you will. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your time again. Thank you for your support. And more importantly, thank you for your consciousness. Good night. Rest well. Tune in again next week. We'll finish this very serious dialogue. So much to say. And uh, seemingly so little time to say it in. Good night. God bless you.